I'm Stan Hawkins, Professor of Musicology, leader of the project Popular Music and Gender in a Transcultural Context. The project has been very keen to examine where we stand today at the beginning of the 21st century in terms of the popular music being produced in the country, what it means to us, the implications and the political and social effects. Another interesting part of this project has been to look at the way in which music technology and studio production plays a major role in constructing the artists who we become fans of, who we end up adoring, and who we, above all, use as our role models. I think the most interesting thing is finding out how gender has changed just in the last 20 to 30 years, how the ways in which we are represented in music are very, very different from how they were 40 to 50 years ago when popular music was starting. So technology has played a major role in this and so has the whole way in which artists are made to sound and look. The main focus of my research has been uh, music as a gendered activity uh, with the aim of understanding more about how musical languages are gender coded. It's not necessarily finding a final solution to issues of gender equality etc but to, to view things in a certain perspective that in, in turn might generate new insights and reflections around these uh, phenomena. What appears to be <laughs> gender equality, gender balance etc, when we look closer at it we see perhaps different patterns and power struggles that uh, are not that apparent. And the chief provider of contradictions is uh, Michael Jackson. While popular culture celebrates gender ambiguity and other types of experimentation with identity, Michael Jackson caused a lot of frustration and provocation precisely because he was difficult to categorize in terms of gender identity, among other things. I look closer at uh, how he uses his voice to uh, create characters and play different roles rather than to represent what might uh, be called his true self. In my project I research into the careers of the two Norwegian artists Marit Larsen and Marion Raven, both as the duo M2M and as subsequent solo artists. How does Marit Larsen go about constructing her own image and persona as a solo artist? And how has the reception of her solo career affected or impinged on audiences' perceptions of Marion Raven? I find both Larsen and Raven to be very apt examples of how ideas of authenticity are so often informed by gender stereotypes. One of my central arguments, and also one of my major findings, is how we may see the career of these two artists, the trajectory of M2M and the solo artists, as a series of reinventions, from child stars via teen stars to solo artists. This type of reinvention also entails a construction of the image of the two artists as ostensibly independent of recording company structures which in turn may reinforce ideas of authenticity and realness in the artists. I have been uh, working on uh, Norwegian rap music. How are these artists and what they stand for connected to what we see elsewhere in society? And how is this shaped aesthetically through musical performance? I use one of their performances in the aftermath of the Second July in order to discuss how aspects of national identity are in constant change and evolving and how music performance and rap music uh, in particular could shed a different light on, on what we consider to be Norwegianness. Musical meaning is not some kind of fixed entity, music in relation to its context is evolving and is transformed and can open up to new reflections about belonging, also about differences and about disagreements. This needs to be acknowledged when living in a society that is constantly changing and transforming through different cultural impulses. In a way, popular music is an interesting mirror on what Norway is today in terms of its culture, its politics, its whole sets of um, beliefs and ideologies. And popular music plays a major role in forming these notions of what a country is and how it sees itself.